Well, again, I think that um, the significance of your book is that you're not speaking to people who who are speaking necessarily of those speaking of this this issue and this crisis in conspiracist framings. They're ne- they're not saying that these numbers are all fake or inflated necessarily, although they may have made predictions that have been false, proven to be false pretty quickly after they made them over and over again. Nonetheless, they they kind of exist in this almost middle space where they're acknowledging the virus is real. They're acknowledging that it's bad for maybe a certain vulnerable population, so on and so forth. So there is credibility there, but then they will dismiss the idea that it's bad for children to get, that it's actually a positive thing for children to get COVID or for anyone else that is not considered, quote, uh, vulnerable, right? But there's a false binary there between being the vulnerable and the non-vulnerable, which is to say that how do you decide who is vulnerable and non-vulnerable? And so I think that one of the major flaws in a lot of these people's argument is that and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit here because we got to kind of unpack where this even came from. But there were certain other ideas that started to seep into the culture around, you know, how we can maintain sort of pre-pandemic economic activity and open society um, while somehow maintaining some focus protection on people who absolutely need that protection. There's certain ideas that became pervasive. And I think it's like, when you're kind of in the middle of the chaos of that moment of the of this time, it's hard to know where things can be traced to. Like, where does it actually originate? Um, so some of these ideas really seem to have derived from a document called the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, and it seems like a lot of these people you're critiquing are in some way or another either tied directly to this document um, or at least at the very least have have ideas that are very similar in the same spirit. Could you talk about what this Great Barrington Declaration is? Yeah, so the Great Barrington Declaration was uh, formally published on October 4th, 2020, and it got its name because it was uh, written in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, the home of a think tank, I think AIR is their name, the American Enterprise Economic Mm -hmm. Research Forum, something like that. Um, It was written by three doctors, epidemiologists, none of whom were worked with COVID patients, but were uh, very credentialed. Jay Bhattacharya, who's at Stanford, Martin Kuldorf, who was at Harvard at the time, and Sunita Gupta, who uh, is at Oxford. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can, the listener can pause now and go read the Great Barrington Declaration. It is very short. Uh, It takes about one or two minutes to read. And this document was very influential in our COVID response. It was written under the watchful eye of a man by the name of Jeffrey Tucker, who was kind of like a cartoon villain. He (laughs) is an anarcho-capitalist type who is overtly pro-child labor. In 2016, he wrote an article called Let the Kids Work, uh, which uh, advised children to drop out of school and work at Chick-fil-A and Walmart. He is overtly pro-child smoking. He feels that teenagers can smoke when they're, you know, smoke when they're young and it's cool and they can enjoy it and they can quit before they uh, have any uh, ill health effects from it. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. he has ties to racist organizations uh, such as the the League of the Confederacy, something Mm -hmm. along those lines. Mm -hmm. And when the Great Barrington Declaration was written, there were a, a camera crew there. There were journalists. So it was a very publicly, uh, it was a production, it was an affair, it was a spectacle. Uh, When when doctors get together to talk shop, there aren't normally cameras and journalists there there to interview us. Anyways, the Great Barrington Declaration was based uh, on this idea that, yes, you could dichotomize people into vulnerable and not vulnerable, which, you know, to some degree you can, you know, a healthy 10-year-old has a very low risk of COVID, not zero, but, but very low. Uh, whereas a uh, obese 80 year old with cancer and heart disease has an extremely high risk. Mm-hmm. And if I describe their vision as benignly as possible, it was that by allowing young, healthy people to contract COVID and build up immunity, uh, it would lead to herd immunity. And they felt that this could happen in three to six months. Mm-hmm. And if we sheltered vulnerable people during that time, so if we sort of separated the two worlds of the vulnerable and not vulnerable for three to six months, and we let natural immunity, herd immunity build up in the not vulnerable people, the virus would go away. So this is the idea, again, of spreading the virus by getting, uh, excuse me, of getting rid of the virus by spreading the virus. 
Mm. There are many problems to this. Uh, again, they assume that one infection led to permanent immunity. They assumed that death was the only bad outcome. And they assumed that the, these two worlds could be totally separated. So they wanted pure COVID for about 250 million Americans and zero COVID for everyone else. So they claim to be anti-lockdowns, but vulnerable people were essentially told to be prisoners in their own home. And of course, all of this became obsolete because within two months, people started getting vaccinated. So this again was published in October, 2020. And by December, 2020, the world began its vaccination campaign, but they were very influential. They had already met with President Trump in the Oval Office and the next day, they were meeting with the uh, Health and Human Services Secretary Alexander Azar on October 5th, 2020, and they started echoing all of their talking points about protecting the vulnerable. And their plan to protect the vulnerable, it, it really wasn't a plan, it was a list of demands. You know, public health officials should feed older people at home. Public health officials should make hotels available for older people to live in if they can't isolate themselves things like that, that sound very easy to write, or excuse me, they are very easy to yeah, write, yeah. but it's much easier to write, feed older people at home than to actually set up a massive nationwide food home delivery prob uh, program for homebound seniors for three to six months. Yeah, it seems, and then it seems also like you talk about how they started to gain some sense of influence, that there was no point that these doctors or these individuals part of the Great Barrington Declaration are associated with it, ever went out of their way as part of their mean their, their way to influence sort of the trajectory of, of the public health response to the pandemic, that they ever even actually follow through in any meaningful way on those things you described, on actually doing that kind of focus protection. Is that true? Not that I saw. So half of the Great Barrington Declaration was open up everything, and the other half was this Yes, the, the sort of focus protection idea. A lot of their ideas were already being implemented because they were kind of common sense, like test nursing home staff frequently mm -hmm. um, or wash hands or have older people uh, wear N95 masks or, or, mm -hmm. or try to meet people outside as much as possible, at least for, for vulnerable people. So a lot of them were common sense and a lot of them were very uh, already being done by the time it was written. But even they recognized that their plan was really just sort of an outline. So a year later, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya suggested, you, he said, we could have used DoorDash to feed vulnerable people at home. And so this idea uh, of tens of millions of 70, 80, and 90-year-olds using DoorDash to, to feed themselves at home, it just shows that they didn't put any, any thought into this. And the main ideas behind the Great Barrington Declaration actually originated in March and April 2020. So in that essay of Dr. John Ioannidis that I referenced before, he said something along the lines of, again, I'm not going to quote exactly, but school closures may diminish uh, the, the chance of children developing herd immunity. So this idea that one infection meant permanent immunity and, and children could be spared the virus by getting the virus uh, was very popular early on. And all of these doctors vastly underestimated COVID, uh, predicting that it would kill 10,000, then 20, then 30,000, uh, or that Sweden, which didn't lock down, was going to reach herd immunity by May 2020. And rather than say, I underestimated the virus, that's where I think they started spreading some of these conspiracy theories that we talked about that you couldn't trust the death counts. I can't be wrong. Right. The numbers are wrong. Right. Well, can I, I would like to sort of flesh out the idea of what herd immunity is. We hear this all the time, and I think it is based on some ideas that are either just like really outdated or have, um, I don't know, I'm curious like where some of the origins of these ideas come from because the idea, like for instance, let me give you an example. I remember as a kid, my mom had me play with other kids who had chicken pox as a way to get me to be immune, quote, immune to chicken pox. I just assumed that like a lot of people that if you get a certain kind of virus, you'll build this natural immunity and defense against it in the future. I don't know if that's true. 
I don't know if that was even the right decision on her part. I don't think, I don't blame her by any means. I don't blame anyone for this. I just acknowledge that there's a certain maybe concept or conception of how immunity actually works, not on, on, on the individual level and on the population level that is being, um, I guess, recommended or being propagated by certain medical professionals that is based in a, in a worldview or based in maybe certain ideas that are just not true. So especially with a novel virus that has been described as a BSL-3 virus, like when we have uh, biosafety labs, there's like four levels. The fourth level is like the highest, most concerning viruses that require the highest level of protocols to work with. And then right under that is BSL-3. And that's where COVID is. That's where SARS-CoV-2 is. This is like a new virus that we hadn't seen before that was spreading among the global population. And yet these doctors had the confidence or the arrogance or the hubris to make vast claims. And not only do they make it one time and then say, oops, I was wrong, sorry, or they make a few claims and then back off, they did it over and over and over again. And I think what was also so strange is that they weren't new claims. They were, they were making the same claims over and over and over again and constantly being proven wrong. A really obvious example is Monica Gandhi, who, <laughs> who was humiliated by Mehdi Hassan um, on his uh, great, uh, the great interview he did with her. But anyway, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm kind of rambling. There's so many points to get to. I, I just wanted to, to, to yeah, sort of yeah. spill yeah. out a bunch of thoughts at you. But I, <laughs> this concept of herd immunity, could you please like kind of go over that? A little well, bit. herd immunity is a very real thing, and we have it, fortunately, for many viruses here in the United States. So herd immunity uh, is, is, is a state where there is no ongoing viral transmission, where the R not, meaning how many new infections each person is going to cause, is below zero. So mm -hmm. what that means is, in just in practical terms, we do have this for measles, for example, uh, when there are, are measles outbreaks, usually what happens is they find clusters of unvaccinated children and several dozen or a couple hundred children get sick, uh, but it, 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 it peters out. It doesn't spread out because there's enough immunity in the population. Mm. Herd immunity has never been achieved through natural infection alone, uh, especially not for a virus that doesn't lead to permanent immunity. So some viruses do. So chickenpox and measles, for example, if you become immune once, your odds of getting sick twice are not zero, but close to zero. Mm -hmm. um, and so your mom, like my mom, made a rational decision to expose us to chickenpox, which is milder uh, in children. Mm -hmm. One infection does lead to immunity. And presumably you were not born before 1995 when there was a vaccine available for it. So under those three conditions, I think it makes sense to possibly expose children to viruses that are less dangerous for them when there are children than they are adults. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 only meets one of those three. It's less dangerous for, for children than it is for adults, but it doesn't lead to her permanent immunity. And we do have a vaccine for it. Mm -hmm. The reason that you can't achieve herd immunity without uh, a vaccine is, of course, newborns. So what would happen in measles in the pre-vaccine pre era in the 1950s and 60s is cases would spike one year as it infected all of the newborns. Then cases would plummet the next year as it sort of ran out of kids to infect. Then a new crop of newborns would be infected. Uh, and so you'd have... Mm -hmm. 3 million infections one year, 300,000 the next year, and would go up and down, up and down like mm -hmm. that. So humanity has never achieved, and it's probably impossible to achieve, herd immunity through a virus, through natural infection alone. I was I was thinking of, of um, we talk about, yeah, the, the sort of idea of herd immunity and the idea that we can gain it through, yeah, through mass infection. It's like there have been really deadly viruses that have been um <laughs> that people have been infected with for for a very long period of time like i was thinking of smallpox isn't that a virus that infected people for a great i mean we've had outbreaks for hundreds of years I mean, thousands of years potentially right uh, and, i think most of these viruses have existed as long as 
medical history can document. And I mean, how, I mean, I, obviously I don't, I don't hear about smallpox any longer. There was a mass, wasn't there an inoculation campaign global or something, something like along smallpox those lines? is one of two human diseases that has been wiped off the face of the earth. Mm, um, right. uh, it, it's, it's uh, entirely due to vaccines. And I'm, you know, we were very close to wiping out polio as well mm. uh, before the pandemic, unfortunately it seems to have gained a little bit of a foothold as well. Um, we'll, we'll never get rid of COVID. It's way too contagious and it has an animal reservoir. So COVID is going to be with us for the rest of humanity. I got to say, I was just speaking personally, I, I find that it's so devastating because it is such a, a nasty virus. It's so bad. You know, I think there was, I, I, I think what was so maybe appealing about like what these doctors you document in your book, what was so appealing to them is that they were providing a false optimism and had continue to. And the reality is not that it's, not, I'm not saying that there, that things won't change for the better in regards to our, our uh, for the virus. Obviously we have vaccines and I want to acknowledge the, the positive impact that's had, of course, but it is still being, I mean, there's still mass infection occurring pretty around the world. And, and, uh, there are tens of millions of people that are experiencing what's called long COVID now. Um, while the vaccines again have, have proven to be efficacious, they also there are there are some problems in the sense that it's it's not inoculating the population against infection. So, while I want to acknowledge that the vaccine campaign has been very positive, it hasn't been a panacea as well. And I think that I find what I find so problematic about doctors speaking in simplistic terms is that they aren't necessarily speaking to the reality of the situation. And, and that happens across the spectrum. It seems to be. Yeah. So th there was a lot of false optimism and you were definitely right about people like Monica Gandhi. Uh, mm -hmm. One chapter of the book is about 20 to 25 pages, starting with Dr. Ian in March, 2020, essentially saying that the worst is behind us. And Doctors such as Monica Gandhi, Vinay Prasad, Marty McCary, Jay Bhattacharya, Lucy McBride, John Mandrola spent much of 2020 and certainly a lot of 2021, which was a very optimistic time because the vaccines seemed much more, or they were yeah. much more effective at the time. It's not like the vaccines, the vaccines didn't fail us. The virus changed too quickly anyways, but they yeah, spent, yeah, yeah. they spent months, every month, uh, they had five quotes saying, the pandemic is behind us, the pandemic is behind us. And in fact, the worst was yet to come. And they mocked anyone who disagreed, calling them prophets of doom and gloom and fear mongers mm -hmm. and breathless, scare mongering. Then the Delta variant arrived. Don't worry about the Delta variant. Then the Omicron variant arrived. Don't worry about Omicron. So over and over and over again, uh, they falsely reassured Americans and their Twitter feeds were full of people saying, we love your optimism. You know, you give us hope. So they told people what they wanted to hear and they got a, a very big following do, doing that. Um, yeah. And they really overhyped vaccines at that time. At mm -hmm. the start of 2021, they told people vaccines are going to be 100% effective. They're going to end the pandemic. And once you're vaccinated, you can act like COVID is over. And that didn't turn out to be the case, unfortunately. Mm -hmm.